Mr. Um, Hamilton, are you out there? You can come in if you are. It doesn't matter. We're going to welcome you. In fact, it's, it's not a joke. I know there are other representatives here tonight, and I think everyone's grateful that they're here. But that's not enough. Could we just have the core document up again, please? I am going to make some comparisons between this case, and not other cases here, but other cases I'm very familiar with elsewhere. And in a sense, I want to start with, with, with one which you might have watched last night. I don't know anybody watches the BBC, BBC One, 8.30 last night, the killing of Mark Duggan. Did anybody watch that? Oh, good, right, because I want to pick up on that. I don't know, as you were watching it, whether a penny was dropping. It's a very different case. I don't want to obviously make parallel or comparisons with the facts of that case, other than a, a theme which appeared in that case. It's, it's only touched on in the film a bit. But you may have noticed that what happened in that case, some of the facts are relevant to what I'm going to say, but not to the facts of this case. What happened there still leaves questions unanswered by the jury's narrative verdict in the case. And this is important to recognize because the jury found that when Duggan was shot dead at very close range within seconds of leaving a vehicle, he actually did not have a gun that he was pointing at the officers who claimed the opposite. Now, I don't need to say more than that. That's the conundrum that remains. The program touched on that. It's a conundrum because, of course, the gun they claimed he was holding when he was shot, of course, he would still have had near him, but they couldn't find it. Problem. So wait a minute. It's found some distance away over a fence in a park. Now, all of this becomes somewhat relevant to how it was broadcast to begin with just like this case, that actually what happened was there was an exchange of fire between Duggan and the police officers, which clearly they were implying led to his death. Oh, sorry, no, mistake. Well, that's not what they said. What they said at the start, and of course it was in the film, the police were very upset. They were saying, no, 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 we didn't, we didn't say that. But someone certainly put it out very strongly, picked up by the IPCC very strongly, and newspapers and the BBC very strongly, such that there was a taint left that actually, you know, he's a gunman and he was involved in crossfire and that's how he died. But actually, eventually, that truth was shown to be a complete falsehood. The police on the ground saying, well, we, we didn't do it. And everybody disowning how that came about, except, of course, the apology, which came very much later. The fact is, they knew from the beginning that that wasn't the case. So how come it took them so long? Although they did deny it in the end. And it's the same theme that is here on this document, which I'll develop in a moment. In other words, it is the denial that one gets very frequently. It isn't limited to the... I just used the Duggan case because it was on the news last night. And the, the questions I've raised will remain for a long time. I have no doubt at all as to how the gun got over the fence and all the rest. There are different views about all that. I don't go into it. 
But intelligence was at the core of that case, and my particular role in that case was to do, try and develop what the intelligence was, redacted documents, we never got to the bottom of it. We weren't allowed to ask the questions. All we know is they had a lot more information and intelligence than they've ever revealed. Our point was this need never have happened on the streets of London. Nobody need have got shot. The gun and the source could have been eradicated. I don't mean by killing, not Duggan, a day or two days before. But the intelligence that relates to this is still in the wings, covered up. So it's not a problem that is historical. It is a current problem. In this case, and in the case I'm talking about, obviously in London and in England. However, I don't have to rely on Duggan. The other case that I finished this year that you may have followed, which has captured public imagination in the sense that it is massive. Its repercussions are massive. Is Hillsborough. What happened there? You all know, don't you? Who got blamed in the first place? Rather like the bar. Who gets blamed for getting killed on the terraces? But the fans, the Liverpool supporters, are blamed right from word go. Blamed. Because they were drunk, they didn't have tickets, all that. I needn't rehearse it because, of course, that taint has stuck as well. Until finally, the narrative verdict of the inquest, which is why, no doubt, you as supporters of the McGurk case want a fresh inquest in order to, under the, certainly the provisions of, uh, uh, of the European Convention, where families are put at the centre of inquests, where bigger questions can be asked than they used to be, is to find out about the sequence. And in Hillsborough, they faced exactly what you've been facing over a shorter period, but a long period of time. Because Hillsborough, plainly, 1989, it's not quite as old as yours. But I, I just say this to you. As a matter of encouragement, really, as a matter of persistence, and looking at the numbers here tonight, Perhaps you don't need the encouragement, perhaps you don't need the persistence, because it's obvious, written all over your faces. And I hope those who are representing the authorities, if that's why they're here, or perhaps they're here for other reasons, I usually ask at this point, is there any member of the British uh, Special Branch here? <laughs> Actually, you, you laugh, I did that at one meeting and a hand went up. <laughs> so, but, but what, what I do want to say is, this is very serious, and there's a message that those of you who are in a position to do anything about this case should be taking back to the chief constable and others. <coughs> now in Hillsborough they faced the same problem, a cover-up afterwards, which is being investigated so I don't say too much about it at the moment. They also faced denial, rejection, investigation, Inquiry, Taylor, then followed by inquest with accidental verdicts, then followed by judicial scrutiny, then followed by a case in Europe, then followed by a private prosecution that failed. Time after time after time. Just as in this case. Obfuscation, obstruction and refusal. However, they didn't give up. And you may be aware that there came a crucial moral moment and I hope your crucial moral moment is only round the corner. Perhaps tonight I'm looking at the back to see if anybody moves or leaves rather quickly. The crucial moral moment for the Hillsborough families came when Andy Burnham turned up to an anniversary and started talking about sympathy, the fact that an injustice had been done and so on. And in the silence of the crowd, one voice could be heard saying, justice for the 96, a murmur which grew rather like a Mexican wave throughout the whole of the 60 to 80,000 people who were at Anfield on that occasion. And he had to stop speaking. It's all on YouTube. You can see the moment, the moral moment. 
in which the people took over. And they did not stop until they realised that the message, Justice for the 96, had penetrated to such an extent that he, to give him his credit, and others, of course, he's not alone in this, <coughs> approached the government of the day and say, at the very least there's got to be disclosure. Key to this case. There's got to be disclosure. And as a result, to give the government of the day credit, they set up what was called the Hillsborough Independent Panel. Now, that panel did an amazing job of uncovering and, in fact, providing disclosure. They shed new light, which was part of their task, such new light that the report they issued led to fresh inquests, which led to the narrative verdict this week, uh, this year, uh, which was searing, far-reaching, and because there is an investigation going on, I don't intend to go into the detail of that. It's the principle in relation to persistence that applies exactly to this case. In other words, it's taken them all that time to slough off the tainted image that they had had to walk around with. The letters that I received from people who said, we have not been able to go to a football match since because we're frightened of being identified as Liverpool supporters, as people who have murdered our own kind. That's how bad it was, exactly as here. So this is an extremely important process that the authorities must recognise. The truth will come to you, to those who persist. So they can't be leaving here tonight believing that this can be got away with. Now I want to come back to some other examples, but I'm going to pause for a moment because if they're still here, I'd like you to pause and I just want to develop this document. This document is probably unlike any other I've had in other cases. You often want in a case a kind of a, a, a golden bullet that's going to shoot its way through. You never really get them, but this is. And the point's already been made, of course, this is not the system <coughs> coughing it up. This is not the system holding its hands up. How many investigations have already been indicated to you did not reveal this document? It took the f a member of the family, just like Hillsborough, to start asking the questions. And, of course, other cases like Stephen Lawrence. And so it's always the families and the victims. It's never the establishment that actually does the job it should be doing, which is protecting you, your rights, and your right to information. Now this document here, once you start looking at it, it's, it's a little blurred, so a little difficult to see. However, it's massive. This isn't about the possibility at the beginning of investigative bias being now accepted. That's the tip of the iceberg. Let's face the truth. So for a moment, you went down the wrong avenue, did you? For a moment, you were beginning to blame the usual target, targets, were you? All right, we'll give you that space. Now, I appreciate it's not Mr. Hamilton at the time. It's others. But in a sense, as Theresa May said this year to the Police Federation in, the United, in London, in fact, Unless the toxic stream of lies is eradicated by inquests and inquiries, in a sense, that canker that grows on the body of the body politic and you will infect future generations. So it has to be extracted. It has to be cut out. That's the significance of actually beginning to, as it were, get a document like this which almost speaks for itself, but not quite. Because the other points, besides it having been dug out by a member of the, uh, of the family with, with the help of the Finucane Centre, which I'm obviously very familiar with, and actually British Irish White Swatch, which was its old name, because myself and uh, a couple of others set that up many, many years ago. So it's extremely pleasing to know that that is with their aid. Now, the document plainly shows RUC oversight on this document. So even if in the first and early hours 
They hadn't appreciated what the army was saying, or at least the experts on the ground were saying. They certainly knew by the 5th, that's the next day, so they certainly know by now, that actually the story was false. And it's not just a question of investigative bias, it is a false story being put out. That should be admitted and apologised for minimum and should be the minimum basis for allowing either for inquests or certainly for an independent inquiry, uh, which is what, what's being called for here. So they must have known because of RUC involvement in this, because the liaison officer that oversees these entries would have been able to say the next day with the massive publicity blaming you know, people on the inside of the bar blowing themselves up, would have been able to say, wait, whoa, 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 that's not right. I've just seen the log. And even if the member of the RUC who oversees entries in this log hadn't himself got the courage, somebody in the RUC would have wanted to see this log in order to, because they didn't discover the bomb. So you'd think they'd want to verify what the army has said they seen on the spot. So somebody should have looked at this. Well, of course they did. They knew what was in this document. Without it, it would be very difficult to, as it were, promote the objectives which you've been fighting for for so long. But with this document, it turns it all around. But there's more to this, because although the timings aren't quite right, somebody's put against the redacted section that it's um, 11.30 to, and then underneath that, 10.50. So it's going backwards. It actually doesn't really matter, because what matters is, when was the redacted entry put in? It's obviously put in after the ATO. So whoever in relation to the RUC is putting it in, whenever they actually, whatever it says, they were putting it in at a time when they must have seen the entry above. So, Mr. Hamilton, how about looking at this document and analysing exactly the truth of it? And also, I would say, Mr. Hamilton, now's the time to bring about influence to ensure there's disclosure of what is underneath. Because the reasons given are complete nonsense. And it is an insult to the intelligence of everyone here to learn that the two reasons given, health and safety, as has already been said, health and safety of whom? Now, if the problem is mentioning names, I don't think any of you here necessarily want to endanger anyone's life. So therefore, you don't need the identities. Now, either this entry has got something to do with the bar bombing, or it hasn't. Now, if it hasn't, it would be very easy for Mr. Hamilton tomorrow to say, well, don't worry, members of the family, you can go and rest at home. That redacted entry hasn't got anything to do with the bar bombing. So, shall we await tomorrow to see whether Mr. Hamilton's prepared to say that? I suspect it'll be another situation in which he's saying he can't comment or something. Of course, if it is to do with the bar bombing, as is suspected, and it's a false story that's being disseminated, and they don't want the identities of those responsible for writing the story or disseminating it at such an early date to be revealed, of course, it's extremely important and if that is going to cause a problem for somebody's health and safety, that is exactly the reason you need an independent inquiry with a High Court judge who has the power to look underneath the black and see what's written there in order to get to the truth. So this document is the seeds of something extremely serious that should be taken seriously and should result in an inquiry being launched into what lay behind this because there's a book being written i think um, george styles was his name in which he too perpetrated the same detailed lie of basically working out in his mind he he, he kind of admits that in the book that he could visualize this group of ira members in the bar constructing a bomb that accidentally went 
This is how bad it gets. It's as almost as bad as what was happening to the fans in Liverpool. Now, with that, as it were, depth, breadth of deceit that has been practiced by the media ever since, you are owed an explanation. And there's been too much evasion for too long in this particular instance. And there's much more that can be said just about this particular document. You can imagine the questions that if, in fact, somebody could get into a witness box like this, the questions that could be asked by me or someone else along the lines we've already been through. So the point is, when we get to accomplices here, is to, it may be difficult to prove that they knew at the time. However, the real point here is, Knowing what they knew on the 5th, why didn't anyone inform anyone else of the true situation? So it's the chain of, of causation in relation to the deceit that's been practiced that needs to be followed through, which of course an inquest can look at. It's looking at the circumstances and how someone died, but they do look at circumstances that are a little bit broader. So what happened on the 5th? which probably has relationship to the fourth, would be the subject of an inquest and questions of the kind that I've just raised. These are the things that are so important and that information commissioners and all the rest should recognise that this isn't about the suspects and other people who can't be traced. It's more about, at this juncture, it's more about you being given the full picture. Now, I'm going to, as it were, extrapolate out of the, this particular case just for a moment. I'm conscious of the time as well. Because the archives at Kew are in fact producing some really rather important information. Because you're not the only ones, it won't surprise you, who've been deceived. Deceived on a major scale. And it may well be that the deceptions that have been practiced by politicians over the years led to perhaps the vote that happened earlier this year, perhaps the hearings that are happening in the Supreme Court at the moment. Because what was revealed in The Guardian, I think it was about two weeks ago, some of you may have noticed. I almost couldn't believe it, but then... Margaret Thatcher was closely involved in Hillsborough. The next day she goes up there. Margaret Thatcher closely involved in another case where they're fighting the same battle as you, or grief. Now what Margaret Thatcher did, and, and it's, it's kind of now, you're so used to it, maybe you're immune, maybe you're anaesthetized to this kind of information. What did she say? What have Tories said over the centuries? Oh, the NHS is safe in our hands. You remember that mantra that they came out with so often, including Margaret Thatcher? Well, what the Treasury notes say that have been revealed recently under the 30-year rule is that while she was saying that, she was doing the opposite. There was, in fact, a plan. Fortunately, it, she couldn't get it through the cabinet, but she tried mighty hard and never gave up on it to basically do what's ha happened now, which is privatise the NHS to such an extent that you would have to have, each of you, private health insurance. Now, I mention all that, and it, you may think it's a long way from the bar, but it's not, because that was a deceit of the first order about policy that she was pretending to pursue, which she wasn't. In other words, she would have done the opposite if given half a chance. Did she say anything about it? No. And it's not far removed, I'm afraid, from you know, the, the people who, during the recent Brexit campaign, kept very quiet during the campaign about what their real views were because they were frightened that it might lose votes one way or another. It's the same kind of deceit. So it's not just the fault of the RUC or senior army officers. They have been set, I have to say, an appalling example over the last 50 years. And you, the public, I think, are fed up with it. And the only way changes 
are brought about over this period of time, certainly in my time. Uh, and I'm just going to list them rather than go into the detail. Again, to give you and lend to you encouragement and persistence, and also say to those who are not willing, because what Mr. Hamilton could do tomorrow is provide his word and say, I think the families should be allowed access to this document. It can be organised in all sorts of ways that ensure that nobody's life is at stake. The other reason that they've given on the document was personal information where the applicant is a third party. So again, that's the kind of information that can be excluded. So Mr Hamilton, either say it doesn't relate to the McGurk's Bar, or if it does, you're quite prepared and would ad ad advocate in whatever hearings are coming up, that this document is revealed. However, the process, this process, has been going on for the whole of my practicing career pretty well. And what is interesting is that the changes that are brought about in legislation and policy, policing and so on, are brought about by you, not by the politicians. You bring the pressure, you keep it up, and in the end, they are shamed into change. Shamed into change. I'll give you a few examples. The Guildford Four and the Birmingham Six, because of the fight for justice that they put up, made huge differences in the end to the legislation relating to the criminal justice system and organisations that look at miscarriages. It wasn't the system putting itself right, it was the victims once again saying, wait a minute, we don't want this to happen to anyone else. A few more examples. Marchioness, River Thames, boat goes down, ploughed into by a commercial vehicle called the, I call it a commercial vehicle because that's what it was effectively, ploughing its way down the river called the Bow Bell. Over 50 people lost their lives. But that family, the families, including Eileen Delalio, the mother, she's now died, unfortunately, a year ago, or so ago, uh, of the rugby player. She and others, like you, fought, knocked on doors, Minister for Transport, until they got funding, until they got hearings, inquests, until they got a public inquiry, and finally got an inquest which said there was a, effectively an unlawful killing, and until they got a public inquiry which changed the face of the River Thames. You probably go there occasionally, and if you do, you maybe don't notice. The life rafts, the dedicated uh, boats by the RNLI, now on the river, which they didn't have. So many changes brought about not by politicians, but by you, effectively saying, we're not going to put up with this. And the story goes on, of course, the big one, for me, was Stephen Lawrence, and the Lawrence is not taking no for an answer. They had to put up with the same thing. It's all right, go home, we'll sort it out. We know what went on. And they, of course, said, no, you don't. And we don't take your answers to us for granted. And it wasn't until Nelson Mandela in London highlighted what was going on. They all thought, oh my goodness, we better do something. And slowly the thing unraveled and there was a public inquiry McPherson inquiry with 77 recommendations for change. And Doreen, I mention it because it just shows real courage, real persistence, now in the House of Lords where she deserves to be. Uh, I'm, I think perhaps it, it, it's an arena which, where she's probably less effective than she was outside the House. But anyway, that's where she is. Still fighting for justice. Doreen, after all this, Neville now lives abroad, decided that each year not recently, but up to a certain point a few years ago. She would get the Central Hall, Westminster, and she'd ask the politicians and the senior police officers to come to the hall and say to them, all right, here are the 77 recommendations. How are you doing on the first 10? And of course they'd have to answer because, like you, she had the moral high ground. And so eventually, but slowly, recognition was given to the fact that it's they didn't want to change the face of policing. There are still police officers who think that what happened there was a demoralization and under, uh, as it were, undercutting the power of the police. No, that wasn't the object. It was to do the reverse, 
to provide the public with some form of trust. And that's, in a sense, what Mr. Hamilton has the chance to do. He's the custodian of your trust. And I hope that he repays that. He's shown some signs. I'm sorry to concentrate on him. I'm sure there are others. And he's just the embodiment of what you deserve. So I'm rather looking forward to tomorrow morning to see whether there's any response to any of this. Thanks for listening. Okay, I'll see you up here, one, two, three.